Tinker Hatfield, thank you so much for sitting down. I know we had some, some technical yeah, difficulties, but uh, we finally made it happen. I have technical, physical, mental difficulties. It's, you know, it's all, it's all in line <laughs> with the, how, I, how I operate. <laughs> um, so I found that you, you occupy a really interesting place in pop culture. And, you know, since we have booked this podcast, I've been doing kind of an informal poll of some of my friends asking if they knew who you are. And the responses tended to be very binary. It was either, are you kidding me? Oh my God, of course he's legend. Or uh, who is that? You know? <laughs> and, and I'm curious, like, you know, is that, is that cult status something that you find funny? I mean, h how do you reconcile that? I, you know, I just don't, I just don't give it much thought. I, I, I guess uh, if pressed, um, I'm, I guess there, um, my impression would be there are some people that are really into design and really into sneakers. And uh, if you are, then you would uh, probably be um, aware of who, who I am and what I do. And then there's this, this whole other uh, part of our society. Um, and I think that's true that that everybody's kind of fractured and you get interested in what you're interested in and maybe you tune out other things. I don't know. I mean, but, but yeah, you're right. I can walk down the street in certain neighborhoods and just get overwhelmed or go to an airport, sign 40 autographs, or, or I could be, uh, and no one even notices. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's one or the other. And that's, yeah, it's really fascinating. I feel like most people are not in that category. Um, so I don't know if, 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 uh, PJ had, had informed you of this, but so I, I shot a book project recently and I spent a lot of time on the North shore of Hawaii chronicling surf culture uh -huh. over there. And John, John Florence is a two-time world champion, f amazing, phenomenal Absolutely. surfer. He's been, he's been working with the same board designer, John Pizel, since basically his entire mm -hmm. career. And, you know, one of the reasons that that partnership works so well is not just that John's a phenomenal surfer and an amazing test pilot, but he's really talented at being able to articulate minor design changes right. and how that affects the performance of the board. Sure. And that's not, that's not always a common trait among surfers. I mean, I think if you talk to shapers, a lot of times they'll say, yeah, sometimes surfers will come back and they'll just be like, uh, yo, that board that board doesn't yeah. work or something like that, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, with that, man. yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so I think that's why part of the reason um, that collaboration works so well with the two of them and they've been able to progress right. so much because right. they can actually, you know, do tests and see how A leads to B. That said, I'm curious what your collaboration and what your process looked like working with Michael Jordan. Because I know you mentioned in an interview that he didn't really open up about a lot of personal stuff and really kind of let you into his head and his heart until like almost the Jordan 20. And, you know, if that's the case, uh, what did the process look like for the previous 16 <laughs> shoes that you collaborated on? Well, I, um, you know, I, I think that he's a private person and he has to be, you know, and that's just what we, uh, I think we all observe with people who are that well known and they, they, they tend to try and protect themselves, their family, whatever. But um, no, I really actually got to know Michael quite well. I would stay at his house and hang, you know, and there'd always be somebody else there like Jay-Z or, or, uh, or, you know, some football, I, you know, you know, there were all kinds of people that uh, were hanging around. Um, and so, but when we would uh, sit down for a design session, uh, we both agreed that there'd be no one else in the room. And, uh, and, and he really, really makes, uh, designing, uh, very easy because he actually likes the process, which is probably maybe what John, John, uh, does, but he also can articulate the differences or the new needs or some deficiency or some, there's, there's usually some very, um, specific nugget of, uh, of info that he would pass along to me. And then that would allow me to, of course, then go back and then figure it out. And, 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 and then, uh, I, in, in reacting to that, uh, you know, conversation, um, I would come up with something and then go back and show him. And he's like, Oh yeah, I love it because, you know, he, he could see that we, and he could try, try to, product on and but he could see that 
his involvement had an impact on the design and therefore things would then go forward um, smoothly and that that the, uh, I can tell you that he's rare he's rare for uh, as a, and you like you said maybe others there are a lot of surfers who might not do that but John John does and I would say that's true in probably every sport that there are some athletes that really are dialed in and they they want to communicate and tell you what's going on and and get really specific uh Kobe Bryant was like that too. And that helps immensely, you know, in terms of improving performance. And then, then uh, of course, in our, in our business, style starts to get kind of infused into that performance process, you know. And uh, so the problem solving for performance is job number one. It is at Nike. It is yeah. for me. It, it was it, – has been for Michael Jordan. So, uh, and then you hope that it just ends up looking cool. And maybe because there's a second narrative that gets woven in. So that And so the, the kind of creative paradigm that you, that you, let me sort of, so the, the collaborative paradigm that you were able to create with Michael Jordan, was that something that, that clicked right away or was there a real long ramp well, up process to be able to figure uh, out? It, it didn't click right away because, um, Michael was actually somewhat um, unhappy uh, with the way things were going, I think, just in general. I mean, the, you know, the Chicago Bulls were not that good this first year or two. And he really uh, made a sensation, sensation um, though, uh, because he, he was obviously really good right off the bat, but they didn't win so much. And... Uh, and he was wearing the Jordan one. Of, and then when he w w switched for the second year in the Jordan two, which was a very technical shoe, but it was, um, I don't think that it, he had as much input into that shoe and he didn't have any input into the first shoe uh, because he was new. He was young, he was new. And they were like, man, things are, had to happen really fast. And he broke his foot. And I think that that upset him and maybe he, I, I don't really know if he truly blamed the shoe, but you could infer that maybe the shoe had was like in the back of his mind. Maybe it wasn't wasn't yeah. quite the right shoe. Um, and just for the for the sake of the listeners who who may not know, you did not work on those I two did shoes, not, correct? I did not. I was the corporate architect, but I but I was close with the designers um, because I was doing work and I would talk to the designers all the time about uh, their spaces or their uh, showrooms or stores or, or presentations of, you know, whatever. And so uh, I knew, I knew all the designers and, uh, and I, and I also knew that he, that, uh, that they, they weren't necessarily um, that versed in developing a relationship with the athlete uh, to, to the point that the athlete was a co collaborator, a collaborator, uh, a co, a co instigator or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and then when I was, when I was thrown into the fray to do the three, it was really, uh, I think everybody was hoping that I would do something that would get Michael back into the fray, back into good graces with Nike in his, in his own mind. Uh, he was always in good graces from Nike's perspective, but, uh, he was ready to leave. He was ready to go to another company. And uh, I'm, I'm, I guess my timing was good that I came up with the Air Jordan 3 and he absolutely um, freaked out. So that was... And the, the rest is that, history. And, you know, that... <laughs> that uh, I, I guess you could say the rest is history, although, you know, it didn't always go smooth. But, it, but you know, we became a team after the, after the, after he saw the three and then uh so yeah. i think every year he he became he trusted me more and more because the shoes were just off the hook in terms of his abil ability to play and be comfortable and and he wanted to wear a new shoe for every game and all that stuff uh and he was starting to win you know and he was starting to uh, you know in the three which is i don't know if anybody if your listeners care but he was the mvp he was the scoring leader. He was defensive player of the year. He won the all-star dunk contest. 
I mean, he did everything but win a championship, you know, in that three, which had not happened yet. I mean, which he had, wow. he had not won all of those things before. And so, that's you know, it was a perfect storm. And then, uh, it, again, a kind of a launch pad into all those other shoes and all the championships. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was, it was wild. So, <laughs> and I think, I I, think you know what? Uh, I'll bet you, you know, maybe when... John John was first working with that shaper. Well, well I'm sorry, his name's John John Pizel. Yeah, yeah. So Pizel. By the way, I have one of those. One of I have a Pizel board, which, which is weird. But anyway, you know, it probably took John John a little bit of time to, you know, sort of like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing, and then they they develop a not only a a collaborative working relationship, but maybe a friendship too on top of it all. So, yeah. So, you know, with that, on that same topic, I was fortunate enough to shoot a couple Nike basketball campaigns a while back. And while that was going on, there used to be a private store in Soho in New York where you could be invited and go in and work with designers and, and make your own sneaker. And I was lucky enough to be invited and, and I went in. And what I found so fascinating is that most of the other people in there that were getting their shoes designed, everybody would bring these kind of inspirations and, you know, mood boards or whatever. But they didn't bring color palettes and they didn't bring pieces of fabric. More often than not, it was songs or pictures of a landscape or a story, like these very abstract uh -huh. inspirations. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering, you know, when you first sit down to work with an athlete, do you take a similar approach? I mean, is the jumping off point for you often something that resonates on an emotional level with the athlete rather than showing them a piece of leather? Yes. Yes. The answer is yes, because, um, you know, when you're out there uh, looking for inspiration, you're also checking the, the boxes off on the criteria list for performance. And those things are all kind of like, you know, expected to be done right. And the shoe is supposed to be a better product than its predecessor. So you check those boxes off. Um, and you re I really didn't like getting into materials uh, and or colors for that matter, uh, until I also, until I actually had a, another story to tell. So there's two stories. Uh, one is okay. Here's here's how the shoe is going to be better than it than it than its predecessor. Number two, here is uh, what how what I found as inspiration, and it, and the story could vary from being inspired by a, a, a Lamborghini or a, or a Ferrari or possibly a song or uh, a woman's fashion runway show. Or, I mean, it could just, it was just all over the place. And I would, uh, I remember like coming in and talking to him about uh, Afropop worldwide at, at uh, a, an NPR radio show. And it was, uh, I saw just a, this beautiful poster in a, in a, in a record shop window. And uh, that became the inspiration for how the shoe and the technology of the shoe and the performance of the shoe was going to blend with something that was going to make it also very interesting looking, you know? And then yeah, I would get a, like an kind of an authorization from Michael then to pursue that. And then when then there would be materials and there would be colors. And so it was like maybe about the third or fourth meeting down the row before we started to actually look at those, uh, those more visceral things, because uh, I wanted to be inspired by a story and then go from there. So that's fascinating. Um, so I, I was, I was reading a book recently called flux and it deals with these tools and strategies that you can use to kind of address and anticipate the unknowns of the future. And they gave two really interesting case studies. One of them was coffee. And they were saying in the late 60s, early 70s, your choices for coffee were basically a big tin can of Folgers <laughs> or a big tin can of chock full of nuts. Like that was basically sure. it. And they cited sneakers as well. I mean, basically you had chucks and keds and in broad strokes that was pretty much your only options uh -huh. what i found in those those markets are obviously billion dollar sectors now multi-billion dollar sectors and i'm curious or 
what I found most interesting about those examples is that both of those things grew to where they are today without a ton of emphasis on technology. Now, granted, there's been major developments of sneaker manufacturing and technique and, and materials, but not nearly to the extent of, let's say, a cell phone, which needed a cellular network and satellites and microchips and this big infrastructure behind it. And it seems like, you know, with coffee and with sneakers, what was more important was, you know, really brilliant marketing and branding, but most importantly, like the fostering of a culture behind those items. Like, do you think that's a fair statement? Do you agree yeah, with that? I think, I think I do. I mean, there are definitely, I don't want to uh, undersell the importance of, uh, of technology as it pertains to cushioning or safety, you know, not spraining your ankle, you know, basically being able to play, you know, um, 80 games, you know, whatever the pros play. Um, you know, there's that, but I, I have to sort of agree with you that um, um, there's, uh, there's this more instant gratification around um, the love of sneakers. Like you have, if you see it and it speaks to you, um, it, you, you, then you want to find out more about it or maybe you purchase it. And I think if, with coffee, well, you know, you, you have a great, you know, espresso or a different or a really great brand of bean of coffee beans or whatever. Um, uh, it, it has, it has a, a big impact on whether or not you're going to buy that again or, or kind of get into it, you know? So, so I think that's, I think when you talk about um, more advanced technology, like and you use cell phones as an example, um, you know that test that stuff takes years and years and years to um, to sort of. Uh, I mean, Apple doesn't like turn out uh, a new a new phone or a new iPad every every six months or nine months or even a year. Um, they, it's it's usually longer than that, and uh, our our market our consumers they expect new stuff every, you know, pretty much every season. And uh, so you, <laughs> you have to like, I think, take a few um, steps forward, but you don't have a, you don't have usually enough time to like, you know, reinvent the, the, the entire notion of what a sneaker is. And, uh, yeah. and I would say that that has happened. Uh, maybe the Hirachi was something like that was really different or, or maybe the back to the future sort of self lacing shoes where there's a, was a lot of new technology and it really changed sneakers uh, a ton. Um, but, but that, of course, but it, that doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, it, those are those are great examples. And like I said, I, I don't, I don't want to by any means diminish the technological advances and, you know, performance elements that you guys have added at Nike. But in broad strokes, just the development of a culture where getting a cup of coffee, quote unquote, is really just shorthand for spending time together uh -huh. or yep. the entire sneaker culture, which is not really performance based. It's more like visceral. You know, it's it's more of demand and cultural. Yeah, based. you know, I, I go back to the song. Uh, uh, it was basically a remake of Summertime by DJ Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince. And they, they redo some, the song Summertime you know, as a rap, as a, and a, a, basically they tell the story of, a, di of a, a summer day in Philly, in Philadelphia. And they, uh, the song just tells you, all, all throughout the song, kind of it's moving through the day, you know? And they talk about sneakers. Like, I got I got to go change my sneakers because we're going to go do some hoops and there's girls there. And and I think that's, that's storytelling about what it's like to be in, in Philly on a nice summer day and all the fun stuff and all the people, the, all the interactions and there it just happens that sneakers just happen to be a pretty big part of that because you might switch your sneakers out to go do some one thing versus another and you know and it's all visceral it all it's all yeah. it's all uh, about you know a uh, feel and uh and maybe uh attra being attracted to somebody else or whatever i mean those things are all real uh and important and i think that's one reason why sneakers are, I think it's one reason why sneakers have gotten so big is that they're they're uh they're not seen as these 
new technical innovations as much as they're uh, extensions of one's personality and they and you choose the right shoe for the right moment or the right time. yeah well, well let me ask you this so i'm personally i'm not a huge sneaker fan i'm, I'm not there's the I'm not a huge sneakerhead, but I definitely have some friends that are. And, you know, in talking to them, there's one theme that, that seems to be consistent. And that's if you were to stand next to them in front of their collection of sneakers, they could tell you for every sneaker, the price they paid, where they got them. Um, and in many cases, like the backstory behind that sneaker, yeah. like there's a real story, a real story that's connected to those, to those sneakers. And, and I know you've talked a lot in interviews about the importance of, the story from the design yeah. standpoint. I mean, even like the, the Jordan 20, it basically has his life yeah. story graphics, yeah. you know, on the sneaker. And do you think that this, this relatively new notion of the sneaker with a narrative or the sneaker as a storytelling device, do you think that that was crucial to sneakers becoming the phenomenon that they have or the success of the Jordans? I, I personally do because I've seen it, uh, and done it, uh, first, you know, uh, at, in person or read about it. And, and then of course I've had these conversations with famous, famous athletes who would just simply tell you a story about how like they would, they, they always lusted after a pair of Jordan eights because when they were younger, their parents couldn't afford them. They never got them. And then when they finally made it big in the major leagues or in the, in basketball or football, whatever, they were able to get them or, or they, or they might even ask for them because they, they were maybe Nike athletes. And, and it's like it, these moments, these, these pinnacle moments in one's life, whether it's a positive one or a negative one, they're, they're, they're real memorable moments. Uh, a lot of times they're attached to a sneaker. And uh, my recollection is that growing up, uh, like you said, I either wore Converse or um, uh, Adidas. And I don't, I don't have any, I, I, you know, they, they weren't special. They, they were just sneakers that you wore just to get, just to get through your day. Uh, but music and maybe, you know, music was... Uh, was something that I remember, like I, I hear a song and it reminds me of something important in my life. And I think that sneakers sort of, uh, I'm not gonna say that music still doesn't do that, I think it does, but sneakers just have become another trigger for memories, for, uh, you know, uh, good or bad. And, um, and they, they also, and so they, that means they have meaning beyond just being, um, you know, you know, urethane foam and rubber and, and some kind of leather textile. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Different. I mean, can you, can you point to a particular chapter or maybe even a particular shoe where there was a split where the sneaker became not this utility, not this utilitarian thing that you wear on your feet, but like a tradable commodity, yeah. you know, because, yeah. you know, sneaker culture and the, and the resale market, there, there's like this whole world out there. I was, I was doing some research, the, the Virgil Abloh one, that's an eighty thousand dollar sneaker. It's nuts. You know, the the, the M and M Cement Three, sixty five thousand dollars for that sneaker. Yeah. Like, how did we get there? Uh, you know, that's a uh, I uh, I think that somewhere along the line, um, modern urban sort of youth culture, you know, just crossed a line, and and sports crossed a line, and they met, and they blended, and. Um, so people uh, were assuming, you know, but I think people were affected by who was wearing the shoe, uh, you know, like an influencer. The influencer could be uh, Michael Jordan or a Charles Barkley or, you know, Penny Hardaway or whatever. Um, but uh, you're also the, the coolest guy in your neighborhood might be an influencer. And so those things kind of like, affect people they might not even like when we would do like um let's just say we you know a lot of times there would be focus studies done you know with the news like especially jordans because uh, jordans were always so unique that the marketing group were they were unsure whether or not they could sell the darn thing and they would do focus groups and the focus groups generally were uh not successful they were they were like not they weren't, they weren't loved. Those shoes were not loved by focus groups, 
But then what you, what happened, uh, because they're so different, but then uh, when you saw Michael Jordan wearing them or you saw, uh, you know, um, LeBron wearing them, I mean, you could just go down the you know list and it's still, you know, over a long period of time. Um, or you saw Jay-Z wearing them on a stage or in an interview or, you know, it just it just uh, it's it started to then uh, uh, change the, the I think the way people thought about sneakers. It's like, oh, those that guy is cool. Or that girl is cool. Therefore, that sneaker is cool. And, yeah. and you know what I mean? It's kind of like. And, and it just sort of kind of blew up. And, and I think that um, especially hip hop culture, too, that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, really uh, blew up or blossomed at the same time that sneakers were. And you could say, well, you know, sneakers partly were uh, have been uh, augmented by the, the, the growth of that kind of uh, hip hop culture. I mean, or you could say kind of hip hop yeah. culture sort of was aided by these sneakers i don't know i mean it's kind of player it's um, it's uh it's it's a would be I, I would love to i would love to read a book that really just really dug deep into sort of trying to trying to describe why all that happened the way it did uh, I, I have shoes i have shoes they're uh limited you know limit being being limited edition like are being really um difficult to to obtain uh drives the price for collectors just through the through the roof it's well that's what i wanted to ask you about that because we had on we had on alex corporan recently and he was the store manager for the original supreme store for many years and we also had on damon way who is the co-founder of dc shoes and we, we talked a lot with both of them about this relatively new practice especially in streetwear of intentionally limiting production supply and how that how that funds demand and and desire and Correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it it seemed like when when you first started working on the Jordans, if you had the retail price and you could afford it, you pretty much had access to those shoes. Is that right? I mean, well, you guys didn't really like traffic in, in doing limited. I think I think in general that's true, but I do remember long lines when a shoe was going to drop and um, people not getting them because they were too far back in the line. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, or maybe. But I mean, was that that was incidental just because there was such demand? But that wasn't strategic. It wasn't on it Nike's wasn't part. Strategic at all? I don't think we understood the phenomena for mm -hmm. quite some time. We were we were just trying to do great performing products that um, happened to just also look m more interesting than anything before them. You know what I mean? It's sort of like uh, you know, it was uh, it, we, I was playing or I was playing this game of. Uh, well, what what do I what do I think will capture the imagination of of people, and what kind of stories can be told in the process as well? So. And, and and currently, or you know, in the recent past, how how involved are you in the marketing decisions in terms of determining the the production numbers or the price point of any of the shoes that you work Spiro. on? Is that something that you're involved in? <laughs> Zero. I, I mean, um, and it's it's kind of purposeful on my part, but also I think there's just people that know uh, know more about that part of the business. But really, um, I always I, I have to have, tell you that my strategy was um, I was there for the athlete. I was always there working to make a better product for the best athletes in the world, or the, you know just everyday athletes. But that was job number one. Job number two was to make them, you know, cool and interesting, you know, and make them interesting. And in order to, and then uh, you might, so that's a collaborative process. And you, you're always thinking, well, this, th I'm working on this right now, but I also, this has to go well, so then I can do it again and again and again. And that, uh, so that kind of, um, uh, means that you do not want to, uh, like with with any of the athletes, you do not want to be um, like seen as a business person. You want to be seen, and you want to be uh, to uh, authentically be uh, 
a collaborator with that particular influencer. Interesting. So from, from the athlete's perspective, you want them to kind of perceive there being a firewall between your role as a creative and Nike's role Absolutely. of trying to sell Absolutely. these shoes. If they think that, I, I mean, I always felt like if an athlete thought or, or an influencer could be a rapper or a you know, performer or somebody, I mean, if they act, I always felt like if they actually thought that I was, I was more of a businessman than I was a, a co-creator, a collaborator or a, or some kind of designer extraordinaire, um, that was way better. Uh, and that, and they were more excited about just, you know, taking my calls and inviting me down to their house or, or whatever. And, and I, I think that had I um, also been part of that, those business decisions that affected could could affect somebody in a very positive way or a negative way. I mean, you know, you know, they're, they goes in both directions. I think that I my my access to that to that influencer would have been, been diminished the next time around. You know? And are there any? Can you cite any examples where maybe you really disagree with the way that Nike handled a shoe? Like maybe a shoe that you were very proud of, but nobody could get. And I mean, do you have like kind of a egalitarian approach that you want everybody to be able to have your shoes, or do you appreciate the kind of exclusivity that some of these sneakers yeah. have, have adopted? Well, I learned a long time ago to just let that water run under the bridge, let it go over the waterfall, and not even think about it. And the reason for that is by the time a particular product makes it to the marketplace, and let's just say it's in a store, um, I'm deep into another design. I don't, you know what I mean? It's kind of like my job, I tried to just compartmentalize into, into being a performance product designer and a uh, what I would call kind of uh, an artistic innovator, you know, which when you combine those two things, um, you get, you get, in, you get interesting products. And, and I just, and then I would just stop there and move on. Yeah. I mean, cause Nike, Nike's had some serious highs and lows over the course of its history, both with, res with respect to, you know, where it stands against Adidas or its other competitors and also like, you know, cultural relevancy. Sure. Does that, that doesn't, that doesn't really affect your approach to design. No, you, uh, you, you stay away from that. Not, not at all. And I, and I don't even pay attention to any other companies. I, I, I don't even look at their shoes. I don't look. I've always been uh, driven by, uh, by my own instincts and, of course, the collaborative process, uh, who, whomever that was. And uh, it, uh, it, it just, I just have really had kind of strict rules about that. And I just didn't, I just didn't want to be affected by it. And, uh, and it's been, been a successful approach for me. Uh, and even though in the end, I might have disagreed with something uh, kind of in, in hindsight, uh, at the time, I'm too busy. I'm, I'm too busy. I'm yeah. traveling around the world, I'm meeting with, you know, Drake one weekend and, you know, uh, LeBron James the next and Kobe Bryant a week after. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, and, you know, I've got projects going on in all different directions and uh, Olympic athletes too. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it was just enough. It was just plenty. I would had plenty on my plate and therefore I had to just basically let, let everything else go. You know what I mean? So, um, so the okay. answer to it is, uh, I just, I had really no interest or really any knowledge about what the prices were going to be, how many they were going to make or what was, you know, you know, what, what, the merchandising group and sales group at Nike were going to do. So I just, I, I just, I, it's not that I didn't care. I just didn't, it did. I didn't think it needed, it helped me, you know? So, yeah. You wanted to insulate yourself uh, from all, so. all that. I think yeah. so. And I think I also wanted, uh, to, again, to be perceived as, uh, as a, as a friend or as a collaborator, not as a business person, you know? Interesting. So, you know, you're, you're, your background to become a shoe designer came through a background, or sorry, um, your, your path to become a shoe designer came through the background of architecture and also being an athlete yourself. 
Is that common or or rare at, at at Nike, and is that unique to the sneaker division? Like, in other words, if you if you're in a if you're a designer in the apparel department, are you more likely to come from a background in architecture or from fashion? Because I mean, there's a lot of overlap between those disciplines, but it ultimately speaks to the relationship between like problem solving and personal expression. I'd say it's kind of a mishmash. I I, I don't think you could say that there are. Uh, more fashionista type people at Nike and fewer uh, ex-athletes uh, or a combination thereof. I, I think it's just all over the map. And uh, and I think Nike is, has, um, I think there are, believe, I believe there are seven or 800 designers at Nike. And um, I have no idea how many of them have a, a sports or athletic background. Uh, or I don't know the percentage of those of that number of designers that are fashion driven or been to fashion schools. I mean, I used to help hire uh, designers, and we'd look. We tend we tend to look at industrial design as a as a fertile ground for finding good footwear designers. Um, and if they had happened to have some interest in or maybe some experience in sports. Uh, so much the better, but it was never, it was never a, a solid requirement. So, you know, as, as someone with such a keen eye for design, I'm curious, like in your daily life, do you have examples of things that from a design perspective just really offend you? Like, you know, just random industrial design. Like for instance, when Damon Way was on, he was talking about he, he cannot stand the headlights and the taillights of the Toyota. And he's just, <laughs> it's, he's like, per, he's personally offended by it, you know? And, and, and I'm wondering, you know, do you have something similar that you encounter every day uh, that just no, gets you? I, I don't get, um, I don't get that emotional about it. Uh, in other words, I, I I can't say that I really love or really hate anything. I do notice I'm, I'm a I'm a good observer. I think most designers that that are successful are good at observing, and uh, I'll I'll say this is how I'll look at it. Oh, that car has a friendly face, and that car has an angry face. Yeah. And I don't make a judgment or about it. I just notice, you know, so cars with round headlights and a nice little grill, they're kind of like a, a, a eyes with a smile. Uh, and like Toyota, you know, they're, they're like slits and they're angled, you know, there's angled metal kind of giving them an eyebrow and kind of like they're more, it's a little more severe, a little more, uh, aggressive, I, I guess you could say, and and I don't I don't pass judgment on it. I just say, oh, that car is, you know, that designer was, uh, or that group of designers was uh, probably uh, trying to be aggressive, and you know, was looking yeah. looking to uh, um, to a certain segment of the population that would be turned on by that. And yet, other designers are like, you know, I'm going to do a cute car, a car that, that's lovable by a, just a different group of people. And so I don't, I don't, make, I, don't I try not to, I try not to be judgmental about that. And uh, I, I know a lot of designers, uh, architects and and product designers and fashion designers, um, who are very judgmental. And I think maybe that helps them, but it, it, it never, it just never occurred to me that that was helpful. I just, I mean, do you find that, that most bad industrial design is lack of attention to detail or just purposeful, but with bad taste? You know, like I, I, for think, it, I think that's... I think it could be all of the above. It could also um, have a lot to do with the decision makers above the designers and what they, the kind of um, impact they have on the design, because that does occur in a lot of companies and, uh, and, you know, a designer might have like have the product uh, altered, you know, um, by someone else, you know, because higher up person decided that it needed it. So, um, uh, and well, getting back to that, I mean, from your case, I mean, did you did you always or do you now do you have, you know, final cut, so to speak, in the sneakers that you create? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I do. Uh, I think in my case, I think I had gotten successful enough when Nike was smaller and uh, that um, I developed, a, you know, I wouldn't say a sort of armor um, or, or protectionism, but it just seemed like people probably just trusted my, my decision making 
more because of this, the success of this problem. Yeah. They were just uh, blowing up all over the place. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking back on your collection and, and all of the sneakers that you've gotten to work on. Is the one that stands out that you wish you could do different? Is there one, I don't want to say a mistake, but is there something that just like always just kind of gets under your skin and you wish you would have handled yeah, differently? The, um, I'm, I've been asked this question in a different way, but, uh, so, but I'm going to try and answer it uh, also in a, in a more unique way. Um, the Jordan 15 uh, occur, uh, was... A product I wish I had back, uh, and the reason for that was is because I had been through a lot. Um, I'd done so many Jordans by then, and I, my father had passed away. My mentor Bill Barman had passed away. Michael Jordan's father had passed away. Uh, I was overworked. I, I mean, I was. I, I'm just had so many other projects besides the Jordan projects. And, and I think I just was just, um, I just didn't, I just, you know, I just didn't bring it, you know, it was like mail. I just sort of mail. I didn't, I wouldn't say mail. I didn't mail it in, but I just think I could have done a better job with it. And, uh, it still ended up being a very unique shoe, but it's not one, it's not one that ever makes it into the pantheon of the best Jordans ever. And, uh, yeah. and I think there's a good reason for it, which is, I think I was just worn out and and uh, and uh, sad and and so so I. Well, I mean, I'm curious. Is there a different way of looking at it? Because rather than saying that you didn't put the effort or you mailed it in, I mean, is there is there a chance that all of that sadness and darkness in your life and Jordan's life? Then when we talked about how important the story is, like, did that creep into the story? Is that an effect, I, or do you think it just you were just too tired to to do I, it how you, you should I, have? I I wish I had it back so that I could, I, I should have, and I could have used that darkness to create, to, uh, finish that shoe off better. And, uh, so, um, there was the, you know, it was some, I don't know, it was an X 15 fighter plane or something. And, and also I'd been looking at Prada shoes and I don't know, I, I was just sort of uh, kind of all over the map on that shoe. And, and so then when I, I finished that shoe and then I, you know, then immediately I jumped into the 16 and I started it and I realized it, this one was going to be an even worse situation for me. Uh, and so then I asked Wilson Smith, uh, a, pro, a very promising young designer. Um, and actually, uh, uh, the, probably the, uh, the, the more appropriate person to sort of take, passed the torch to at this point and he did he did the 16 i started it but then he he really you know nurtured it along and then finished it so and right. uh, and then there were a few other there were other designers that stepped in and then when it came to the 20 michael called me up and said you got to do the 20 but so i would had a i'd had some i I'd, I'd had some time off from the jordan line and i was ready to jump in and do something you need for that so cool um well we always like to end the podcast by asking the host uh, sorry we always like to end the podcast by asking the guest to plug something that they're not directly involved in but they feel isn't really getting enough attention whether it's a book or a movie or an artist uh, a cause or maybe a brand like is there something that you want to kind of give some shine to that you, you want people to know about that really that you're really feeling right now um God, that's a tough. That's a tough question. It's it's not like something that just pops. I'm gonna. I have to. I have to think about this for a second. Um, yeah, take your time. We can go. We'll, 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 we can trim this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's it. You it, know, it, it it always boggles my mind um, that uh, really great work um, doesn't you know necessarily catch on. It, it, uh, you know, and for a variety of reasons, I suppose. Um, uh, but having said that, um, uh, you know, I also know that great, great work um, needs, uh, it, it needs, it needs to be appropriate for its time and place, but it also needs to help people move to a new place. Um, so it's kind of a fine line between being uh, like appropriate, but 
just nudging its way forward. And, um, you know, I can think of a lot of uh, uh, products um, or maybe maybe even music that kind of does that. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I would, I would, I, I'm struggling, but I will tell you that um, there's a, there's what I, what I would consider um, uh, in the, the world of music as an example. Um, uh, and I, I feel like, um, there are there are uh, jazz artists and, uh, um, that uh, are not not well known or not understood, and I I think that it really bums me out and that the greatest musicians of our time are you know kind of like have small small audiences, and that's just a more of a general comment, not a specific one. I will tell you though, there is uh, uh, I will sort of twist your question a little bit into a different mode, which is uh, Jean-Baptiste, uh, who um, has um, been a jazz artist and now he's kind of a pop sort of, he's becoming a, a more pop jazz and maybe a little bit of rock and blues uh, out of New Orleans. I, I see him uh, uh, now, I see him sort of breaking the breaking that glass ceiling for uh, for performers like that for artists like that and yet there's another uh, artist from the same neighborhood with the same level of talent and his stage name is trombone shorty and he is isn't uh isn't jumping that curb you know what i mean and um i think john baptiste because he was on the Stephen Colbert show and he was, he developed a personality and he got to, you know, sort of showcase his work uh, a little bit more. And then he turned, he turned it into now his, own, he's like, now he's, he's a, he's won Grammys and he's done a lot of stuff. And, and uh, I, I, I think that um, Tron Bon Shorty uh, is just as, is is amazing. He's I I, I don't, I'm not going to judge him against Jean Baptiste, but they're from the same neighborhood. They're the same age. I know. Well, I know Trombone Shorty, and he's told me all kinds of stories about Jean Baptiste, and and they're 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 buddies. Yep, and they're both amazing. And that one's you know one's jump jump that curb. So, um, I I think that Good. I didn't answer your question the way. You might have hoped, but uh, but no, those are good. those are great yeah. examples because I think a lot of people are not familiar with either one of those artists, or particularly Trombone Shorty. Yeah. So they'll give people a chance to yeah, check them out. I think that people should check out the the artistry, but um, they, they have um, they have soul and they have um, you know the, the this what uh, Carlos Santana would say they care about each note and they get to the heart of those notes and they they're they're true artists and um it's not just a bunch of just it's not just a bunch of stuff you know that someone else wrote. Yeah. i mean they're doing they're, they're really they're really feeling it and they have they have the, the ability to make it beautiful or interesting or something danceable or whatever um so i think that that's kind of uh, something that i wish uh you know uh, I, I wish more artists like that would get uh, a little more attention. Recognition. Yeah. Um, I have actually one more question that I'll probably slice in earlier, but I, I thought was really, I think it's really, um, you know, interesting. I'm curious to get your perspective. Uh, moving, you know, uh, switching gears for a second, like how important is your physical environment to your design process? I mean, I know people can find inspiration from a pencil or a song or a cloud. It, it, does that really affect you on a, on a, day-to-day level or could you find if you had to under pressure ipad and a stylus you could go into a box and make a great creation i think i could go into a box but i've said this before i'm going to say it again my best work and i think almost all of my work is actually an affectation or a result of all the experiences and uh, that i've had in my life up to that point so if I had uh, lived in a small community in the middle of nowhere for all the, for all these years, I would have a, a smaller 
you know, kind of uh, backlog or pallet of things to work from. And so I am purposefully uh, a world traveler. I'm a, a participant in all kinds of crazy sports. I'm usually in and out of the hospital because I get injured for doing crazy stuff, you know, uh, and uh, I'll try anything. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a bad surfer and I've had some hold downs and I shouldn't be out, you know, all that kind of. But, you know, all of those experiences or going to a concert and listening to somebody very weird and unique, all of those things just get end up in my subconscious mind. And when I sit down to design, uh, I believe that those experiences affect whatever I draw, whatever I think of. And um, so if I've been in a box all these years, um, I have precious few things <laughs> to think. <laughs> to be working from. So you can go into a box, but it's all of those resources from the entirety of your well, life that you can call upon yeah, when you're actually I, I putting now I pen can, to paper. Because now, I mean, now I could go into a box because I have a pretty good backlog. But I think really, if you want to stay relevant as you get older, I'm, I'm 70 years old and people are like, what, you're that old? I mean, you can't believe it. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm 70, but I do stuff along with side 30 year olds or 25 year olds. And I, I do, I, I go to rap concerts. I mean, I, I go, I mean, I, I snowboard off the top of mountains and ski and surf and put myself in all kinds of crazy situations. And I think uh, that adds to, again, my ability to stay relevant and continue to do interesting work. So that's amazing. There you go. That's my, that's, that's my final answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tinker, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to have this conversation. I know you're an incredibly busy guy. And um, just to clarify, you stay out of marketing decisions, so you are not the person I should hit up for the next quick strike drop, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I would. I, I'm always like, what the hell just dropped? I don't even know. Oh, yeah, God, I, I guess I shoot, who can I call to get one of those? I mean, I don't know. I have no clue. And, and I, and I, I, that, I find that hilarious. It's, a, it's actually been a good strategy for me because I'm not affected by all that stuff. And uh, so there you go. I mean, it's uh, trying to keep, trying to keep my, uh, my files a little bit cleaner and more organized, but still full of color, you know, full, full of, uh, interesting adventure uh but great i don't i don't know that thinking about all that other stuff would be would be helpful to my design process great well it's been such a pleasure getting inside your head and uh i, I really appreciate it and uh i wish you all the well, best hopefully our paths uh, will cross soon uh, you you come highly recommended of course i've seen i've seen uh a number of your uh podcasts anyway and uh i want to thank you it's been an honor to be uh chosen to to visit with you and it's it's always fun uh and this this will be yet another thing that i'll that will who knows i'll probably design something based off of this conversation you never know that's i'd be very honored thank you all right okay